Heavenly Father, we bless your name this morning. We thank you because of what you have been doing. How your mighty hand has been upon us since we came on Wednesday night. We bless your name for having led us thus far. For all the messages we have heard. For all the seminars we have attended. For all the workshops we have participated in. For all the planning strategy sessions we have been involved with. And for this moment now, when we come to the very last message for this minister's conference, how you have spoken to us, how you have woken us up, how you have convicted us, how you have driven us from within, how you have fired us from within our very soul, how you have implanted a vision, a burden within us, how you are laying the load of evangelism, the burden of world evangelization upon our heart. And here we come at this momentous time, ready to go out into the harvest field and work for you. Lord, like soldiers you have called, like people that you have raised up, we're going to rise up and we're going to do your work in a militant, dynamic, triumphant manner in Jesus' name. Lord, our ears have heard a lot. Our minds have understood a lot. Our spirits have received a lot in this conference. We have prayed, we have cried, we have wept, we have called upon you, we have laid everything upon the altar, we have sung together, we have done everything, we have studied, we have listened, we have shared with other people. And Lord, here is the, the climax time when all that we have been saying by word of mouth, we go out into the harvest field to make it practical, to show you to show the world, to show the devil, and to show anybody that is an onlooker that we mean everything we have said. We mean every word we have uttered. We mean every prayer we have prayed. Every consecration, every vow, we mean everything to every letter. And therefore, Lord, as we come to this time, ready to launch out, ready to go out, Father, we pray we will never look back in Jesus' name. Already we know that in the harvest field, many started before, but now a lot of people are no more on the harvest field. They looked back, they went back, they backslid, they got discouraged, they allowed the devil to run them out of town. They allowed the devil to run them out of the ministry. They allowed the devil to take the better part of them and to trample over them. But here we are this day, committing ourselves before you consecrating ourselves unto you that we have laid our hands on the plow we will never look back whatever the devil may say whatever the agents of satan may do lord here we stand in unison in cooperation in harmony and unity together promising you that till the end of our lives we will serve you we will serve you we will serve you you can depend upon us. You can trust us. You can have confidence in us. We will never disappoint you in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, we pray that this morning, as we look at the word of God, the very word will be stamped, registered, and written indelibly upon every heart in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that as your word comes forth now, your fire will come with your word. Your power will come, will, will, your wisdom will come with your word. Your anointing will come with your word. And Lord, on every heart, every soul, everyone here, Father, we pray, we will never be the same again in Jesus' name. Lord, only one purpose do we have in life now. Only one goal do we have in life now. Only one desire do we have in life now. Only one aspiration, one ambition do we have in life now. Only one desire and only one business do we have in life now. There's no other thing for us to do except for the rest of our lives. Every moment, every minute, every hour, every day, every week, every month that will pass. Lord, all that we have in desire is now to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. To have a souls into the kingdom of God. We pray, Lord, when temptations will come to slow down, when temptation will come to keep quiet, 
when temptation will come to leave the work of the Lord, when temptation will come to go back into business, when temptation will come to start making money, when temptation will come to just settle down in a family life, when temptation will come to go into politics, when temptation will come to travel about all over the world, when temptation will come from the devil, from our relatives, from our mind, from our flesh, that we will not continue the preaching of the gospel, we pray you'll give us the power you give us the boldness to trample every temptation under our feet in Jesus name we will serve you we will serve you we will serve you we will preach this gospel from every part of this country to the other part of the country we will saturate this country with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ young people will hear old people will hear the men will hear the women will hear people in the government will hear the rich people will hear the talented people will hear even the beggars on the street will hear the people in the marketplaces will hear those in their farms will hear in every city in every major town in every in every town and city they will hear the word in jesus name father we pray that this will be the group of people that you will use in your own providence and power to take the gospel to every creature in this whole land. Lord, we commit ourselves to this one goal, to this one job. And Lord, we pray that we'll never look back. All that we need, grant unto us. And we know we shall be successful. When your people become tired, strengthen them. When they become weak, give them power. When the devil is bringing confusion, give them stability. And when it appears they are dry, give them freshness. When it appears that the instruments of harvest are becoming blunt, sharpen their instruments. When it appears their messages are no more having power and authority, pour the anointing upon them afresh. When it appears like old Eli, that their eyes are becoming dim, open their eyes that they may see in Jesus' name. When the people of God become, begin to become deaf and they cannot hear the voice of God from above, open their ears in Jesus' name. When the feet is becoming weak and tired, we cannot stand to preach anymore. When it appears that we are becoming fearful, I pray you'll give us both power and boldness and fearlessness to declare the oracle of the Lord in Jesus' name. I pray that in a very special way, anointing will fall upon everybody here today. Power will fall upon everybody here today. Fearlessness and boldness will fall upon everybody here today. And as these people go out to every part of this country, I pray that signs and wonders, power and authority, the supernatural, the miraculous, will follow everyone in Jesus' name. As they lay hands on the sick, heal the sick. As they open their mouths and they manifest the authority in the name of Jesus, and they cast out devils. Oh Lord, I pray the devils will come out in Jesus' name as they present the gospel to the people that need to be saved, the people that need to be born again. I pray that the Spirit of the living God will bring conviction upon them and they will rush to the altar and they will be born again in Jesus' name. Where the devil has planted rebellion in any church, where the devil has planted people that bring division, disunity in any church. Oh Lord, I pray, before we even get home, you will deal with that source of rebellion, that source of division in Jesus' name. Anything, anything that will weaken the hands of these people who are here this morning. Anything that will shut the mouth of the people that are here this morning. Anything, anyone, whether spirit or human or a material thing that will hinder the progress of the preaching of the gospel from those who are here this morning. Oh Lord, I pray you'll knock it out of their lives in Jesus' name. I pray that the blood of Jesus will cleanse everyone, will cover everyone, will embolden everyone that Lord, the people that are here, they will never be the same again in Jesus' name. Speak to us now. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Before we bring everything to a close, I'm talking to you this morning on last days for the harvest. Do you know these are the last days and that we have just a short time to do the work that we have to do. 
In Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Verse 33. So likewise ye. When ye see all these things. Know that it is near. Even at the doors. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Lord of Lords, King of Kings, Wisdom personified, the expert, the one that knew and still knows it beginning, the one that knows all things, the one that has the Spirit of God without measure. He looked at his own disciples, and his disciples were inquisitive. They wanted to know three things. Number one, when what will be? The sign of what was spoken about, about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Number two, what will be the sign of your coming? Number three, what will be the sign of the end of the world? The end of the age, the end of this period of time. And Jesus began to give them the signs that they will see. And they will know that that question they were asking, what will be the sign or the evidence that the end is coming? Or that the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is very, very near. What were the signs he gave them? In the, from the beginning of the chapter, he began to tell them, verse 6, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Ask yourself. If you are listening to the, news, uh, to the news over the radio, if you are reading the news in the papers, if you, are if you are conversant with current affairs, you will know that all over the world, there is war. All over the world, you have rumors of war. In fact, people do not know now whether the third world war will come or not. One thing we're sure of, there has been wars. Almost every nation in this world has tasted war and the ravages of war. Of some of the nations are even still in the midst of warfare right now. And then another thing is that Jesus Christ himself said in verse 7, Nation shall rise against nation. If you are reading the newspapers, you will know in Africa here, nation have been against nation. And we are not ignorant of sometimes uh, Cameroon, Nigeria. Sometimes it is Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, and Liberia. Sometimes it is Angola, Mozambique. Sometimes it is South Africa and a neighboring country over there. But the point is this. Jesus said, you will hear that nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. If you are reading the newspapers, you will see that even right now, this very month, there are some kings. They still call them kings in their own empire, where they are. They, are, they go into exile. They just run them out. It may be that the military takes over in that country, and then the king has to be driven out. It's happening right now, and it's been happening for some time now. And then it says, famine. Oh, you know that. Not enough to eat. Pestilences. That's talking about terrible, terrible diseases. Don't you know if you're reading the papers every time, you're giving the statistics of how many people have AIDS. A-I-D-S. A kind of disease that people catch and there is no medicine. Once they catch it, that is all. And it's almost in all the countries of the world. And they are reporting, medical people are reporting now that these pestilences, and it is a kind of new disease. And it has no cure. Except by prayer and miracle. The doctors are telling us about their helplessness. That all these pestilences, they do not know how they will deal with them. Do you know that sometimes, uh, you know, when you have all this uh, published in a country, uh, you have about 100,000 children that die every year in this country. 100,000. That's pestilence. And when you go to different countries in Africa here, hundreds of thousands of people old and young how about the people that are dying on the on the roads because of drunkenness how about the people that are dying because they are swallowing drugs how about the people that are injuring themselves how about the suicide that is on the increase and then he talks about 
earthquakes in diverse places. That means the trembling of the earth. That even the earth will begin to tremble. There had been, there had been peace in the earth, in the soil before. But now even the earth is groaning. The burden on the earth is so much. The pollution of the air is so much. And the disturbance in the sea, if the geographers will tell you, the disturbance on the sea is so much. And then it says now it will be in diverse places. It says all these are the beginning of sorrows. That when you see these things, begin to be alerted and know that we do not have too much time anymore. Then it says in verse 9, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and they shall kill you. Ah, oh, you know about that. You know about that. When people get converted and the people that are fanatical around them in the left-hand sided religion and they will say, No, we're not going to have that. And they will even go about, first of all, they can take his wife from him. Then they can even seize all his children. And eventually they will, they will even be looking for him. And they will say anybody that kills him has done their God a, a world of good. There's persecution today. You know, Vincent was sharing with you a man that we heard about in Lausanne. And um, he was uh, put in charge of a soak away pit. That is where the waste product, the toilet things are going. In the soak away pit, he will get in there. He was taking a prisoner for many years because of preaching Christ just preaching Christ and then over there he'll just remain there and be singing just singing to the Lord and doing that dirty thing eventually they released him but you see there is persecution today there is another one that we heard about uh, in uh, Lausanne you see he knew the Lord and in that country they said you cannot follow after Christ it was a national law a decree in their country if you said you gave your life to the Lord, there are some things they will do to you. The alternatives are either they will take your wife, take your children, take the house, take everything you have and just make you completely uh, without anything. Or they will deport you. You go to another country. You cannot live in that country anymore. Or they just kill you off straight. And this person, it was at the airport. Somebody came in through the airport and shared the gospel with him. He received the gospel. But immediately, when he received the gospel, he went to Bible school outside that country. But then they had had the information that he had received the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, um, he, and that was the first person in that country. It, nobody should receive Christ in that country. It, that was their old law. When he was, as he was coming back from the Bible school, they just got him. And they locked him up to await his trial. Where they put him for three months was a little room. And he could not lie down. It was so small he could not lie down. It was even so small, they constructed it specially for him. He could only stand up. And then they will bring his food for him. And the food was rice. But then, every, every day, that's the meal. Just once a day, they brought food for him. So that they didn't want him to die because they wanted to try him in the court. And they, will, they wanted to punish him in such a way that nobody will ever dare to be a Christian like himself. So for three months, they kept him. The rice they gave him on the first day when they brought the rice, they put salt in it. And the salt was too much. When he tasted it, he saw that he couldn't eat it. He looked up to the Lord Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. And when you get into trouble, remember that name. When you get into persecution, remember that name. When you get into difficulty, remember that name. He remembered the name. He prayed to the Lord. Miraculously, God neutralized all the salt there. He ate everything. The people that brought the food, they didn't know how he could eat it. And they were serving him like that, serving him like that, every three months. And then they charged him to the court. And at the court, the chief of his village was there. The wife and the children, they were there. And then all the, you know, key people were there. And then the person that was having the greatest authority in their law court was there. And then they called his name. And he prayed before that time. He said, Lord... You are the owner of all the earth. You are the foundation of everything. How will this whole country say that it is illegal to become a Christian? So he prayed and he got to the court. Didn't the Bible say that when they bring you before the council and before the governors, do not premeditate what you are going to say. The spirit of your father which is in you will speak through you. 
And then as they were in the court there, they asked him, they said, uh, you know your offense? You know it's a crime to become a Christian in our country? And you are the first person to commit that crime. Nobody has ever done it. And you know the punishment. You are a citizen of this country. Do you know what should be done to you? You know the three alternatives. Answer. And he didn't know what to say. So he knelt down, raised up his hand, and began to pray to the Lord Jesus. The magistrate rose up and said, he is mad, he is mad. Drive him out. That's how they drove him out. They never judged him. They never killed him. They never took his wife and children. They just said, he is mad, he is mad, take him out. He went out, and one of the policemen that were in charge of the prosecution, he talked to that person. That person also became the first convert. And then he began to talk to other people. By the time we met him last year in Lausanne, a militant church had stood there <laughs> with a lot of people that were worshipping with him already in that church. But the point is this, they will deliver you all to be killed. You see, it says here, there will be persecution. Don't you see that persecution in different parts of the world? And Jesus said, when you begin to see all these things, know that the end is very near. And then it says in verse 10, And there shall, then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Do you know about hatred, even in Christian circles? Do you know about uh, criticism, even in Christian circle? Do you know about crucifixion, even in Christian circle? A brother will crucify his own brother. A minister will crucify another minister. A church will crucify another church. And of course, the other religions too, they try to crucify and criticize and condemn the people that are following the Lord. Jesus said it will happen. And many false prophets shall rise up and deceive many. Many false prophets. You see all over the country, many false prophets. You see all over the continent of Africa, many false prophets. You see all over the world, many false prophets. Jesus said, very near the time of the end, these are the signs you will see. There will be many false prophets. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Look at that verse very well. You know, in the past, there were not many international gatherings planning the conversion or the evangelization of the whole world. But now if I can tell you, there are groups of people internationally that are coming together and they are planning how the presence of Christians and the presence of the message of Christ will be felt and known and registered in every nation of the world. And virtually now, that message had been published. There are about uh, three or four radio stations, major radio stations. From the policies they have written out, from the strategies they have written out, they have written that within the next 10 years, they can bring the message of Christ to virtually every home, to the Arab world, to the Middle East, to the continent in America, Canada, Europe, everywhere they can bring the gospel in. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Not only that, there is a, there is a group of people internationally, they bind themselves together in cooperation and in unity. And their commitment is that they are going to distribute Christian literature. To all the world that every family in the world will have a gospel literature so that nobody will say he has not heard and you see that's another body another group of people there are some other groups of people they have looked at all the languages of the world and they are recording messages gospel messages in all the languages of the world that no matter what language you are speaking no matter how few people are speaking that language, they have put the gospel message together. They want to have all these people hear the word of God. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. There's another body. 
And these people, they have international support. And there are people walking along with them. They have brought out the theme of the Lord Jesus Christ according to the Gospel of St. Luke. And then they have divided the whole world into 5,000 segments. And in every segment, they have planned how they will reach every corner. Every individual, every boy, every girl, every man, every woman with the message of Christ through that theme that they are producing. I can tell you about international conferences, international organizations, international policies and strategies that have been drawn up to fulfill this. You know, with all this, because if you think about it, 20 years ago, all these international things were not there. To think about the evangelization of the whole world and to do it in such a practical way that today people know that it is a possibility now jesus said when you begin to see all these things that i've outlined that i've read to you just now when you begin to see them coming to pass you know that the end is here already and then he gave a climax of the whole thing the children of israel the jews had been scattered all over the world and as they were scattered, they have been wondering when their time will come, that they will go back into their country. Because God himself had prophesied in the word of God that I will gather my sheep from every mountain where they have been scattered. Moses prophesied about it. Ezekiel prophesied about it. Jeremiah prophesied about it. Isaiah prophesied about it. Osea prophesied about it. All those minor prophets, they prophesied about it. That a time will come when the children of Israel, from wherever they are scattered, wherever they may be in the, on the face of the earth, they will be gathered together. And Jesus said, learn a parable of the fig tree. When its branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh and then he talked about the children of israel when you see them the other passages there's no time to read them now and he said when you see them that they are gathering together you know that the end is very near come back to verse 33 so likewise ye when ye shall see all these things not just one of them and you can see all the things that i've read to you about war about rumors of war about nation rising against nation, about kingdom against kingdom, about pestilence, about earthquake, about false prophet, about false Christ, about the children of Israel gathering together, about the love of many waxing cold, about iniquity abounding, about promiscuity, immorality expanding all over the face of the earth, and about international bodies preaching the gospel, wanting to touch everyone with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and all the Jews being gathered together back to their land. When you begin to see all these things coming to pass, you know that the end is very near. At the time of the end, what should be the preoccupation, the ambition, the aspiration, and the thing that the children of God or ministers of the gospel, they concentrate upon. Let's look at John chapter 4. John chapter 4. I'm reading to you from verse 35. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Here the Lord was saying that do not think the time is far away, that we are not to evangelize now. We can get other things done now. It says, do not say there are yet four months, and then there will come the harvest. It says, Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. In this country, there are a lot of harvests to be gathered into the kingdom. You know, if you are studying the country, if you are studying this country, you will know that this country is blessed in a way, but the blessing gives us problems. There are more than 400 languages that are spoken in this country. And when you see that, it's a challenge. And the Bible has not been interpreted or translated into all those 400 languages. There are people in this country that do not have the Bible, not even the New Testament, in their language. Not only that, do you know that in this country we have about 40 million children or even more 
that is the teenagers downwards when you think about that you begin to see that there are a lot of people in the villages young young people except we preach the gospel to them there is no way they can hear the gospel do you know that in this country about 55 percent or thereabout are below the age of 20. that means the majority of people in this country more than perhaps 60 million people will be under the age of 20. and if we do not reach out to them those children will become so hardened they will not be able to know what to do do you know that in this country we have at least um, 50 percent of the whole country as women and, and you know most of the people in our land i spare the old people they did not educate the women as they educated the men which means we have a lot of illiterates among the women folk and except we evangelize them who is going to evangelize them do you know that there are areas in every state take Gongola state for example there is a part that is very near cameroon where conditions are very poor the roads are very poor the lighting system is very poor even some of the villages and some of the places there you do not have primary school primary education available for those people think about uh, you know the people that were discovered recently uh, you know some years ago now the magusawa people think about some groups of people that are so tied together in their village community that it appears that it is difficult for anybody to penetrate and the lord is about to come and the end of the world is about to come and these are the last days and jesus said now we need to do the work urgently nobody can say well we will relax a little we will do other things a little he says do not say four months and then i'll be ready three months and then i'll be ready or sometime then i'll be ready to, for the call of god now is the time and as we're going from this conference today i want to leave this with you do not waste any time in fact as you are going if you have opportunity even before you get home stand up in the bus where you are and declare the gospel of the lord jesus christ as you get to the place where you are going the people that come to uh, you know bless you and come to greet you because you travel and you are just coming back preach the gospel to them and do not wait until sunday today is tuesday are you going to wait until sunday before you preach the word of god are you not going to gather people together even and are you not going to gather all the christians in your church together and say the time has come the time has come we're not going to say four months and then comes the harvest this is the time of harvesting we're going to do the work i said we're going to do the work every part of this country we're going to penetrate we're going to preach we're going to bring people out of the kingdom of darkness and we're going to bring them into the kingdom of the lord jesus christ and then in verse 36 he that reapeth receiveth wages you know that you know that that is reward for the people that are serving the lord there is reward for the people that will preach the gospel and then it says and gather fruit unto life eternal that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together and herein is that saying true one soweth and another reapeth i send you to reap whereon ye bestowed no labor other men labored and ye are entered into their labors very briefly let me talk to you about the call for harvesters the lord is calling people to harvest this whole nation this whole nation and i dare tell you that the people that are here were not sufficient were not enough the lord is calling for more let's look at matthew chapter matthew chapter 9 matthew chapter 9 reading from verse 36 and when he saw the multitudes he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd then says he to his disciples the harvest truly is plenteous but the laborers are few pray ye therefore the lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest call for harvesters I received so many invitations from outside Nigeria in Africa here. They want, uh, they want me to come and preach to them in this country, in that country, in that country. And uh, one of the reasons why we're here together is that I'm believing that uh, God will do it in his own way. That he will so join us together. 
He will so knit us together. He will so harmonize us together that by the grace of God, if a call is coming and we are too busy, we'll know the ministers, we'll know their itinerary, we'll know their schedule, we'll say, minister of the gospel, doesn't matter what your name is, deeper life or whatever, or another kind of name. We'll say, minister of the gospel, we are very busy, but an urgent call has come from Kenya. Can you please take this invitation and run there? And you know, if there is understanding and there's fellowship, there's unity, there's harmony, and there is love and cooperation, I believe that will be possible. Do you believe that is possible? And you know, all of us that are here today, we are not enough. We are not enough to preach the gospel to this country, Nigeria, or to preach the gospel in the whole of Africa. That's why I believe you as a child of God, you as a minister of the gospel, as Jesus has said, is calling many people. The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few that when you get home, all the cassettes you have bought from this conference, you give it to other ministers. God needs everybody. God needs everybody. All the literature you have got, all the information you have got, and if you don't have any cassette, if you don't have any literature, all the notes you have taken, you will go to another minister. You, you remember the message of the other day? You reproduce at least 30 other pastors like yourself. If you are on fire, set 30 other pastors on fire. If you have a call, and you are sure of your call, and you say, oh Lord, do or die. I am going to do the work of God. If your consecration has gotten you to a point of no return, find 30 other ministers of the gospel. And if they are getting discouraged, encourage them. If they are getting downtrodden, lift them up. If they are weak, strengthen them. So that by the grace of God, the vision in you, the burden in you, the anointing on you, the power on you will be reproduced in those other ministers in Jesus' name. This is not the time I can do it alone. I can do it all myself. I know I have the call of God. And I'm going to preach from corner to corner, from coast to coast. This is not the time. You must go to all the ministers of the gospel and challenge them. And that's what we want to do as, a, as part of the body of Christ. Just to bring you in here and the people that you are going to contact, just to challenge them. Just to fire them up. Just to put conviction and backbone in their ministry. Just to show them you can do it. Just to encourage the people. And I think it will be a wonderful thing. If you can raise up 30 others, 20 others, 60 others, 100 others. And bring them to the point and to the place where the fire of God will be burning in them. And the fire will never get out in Jesus name. I grew up when I was very young. I grew up in the farming area. My father had farm. And sometimes we had more than one farm. We had a farm over here. And then another place where we planted another kind of thing. We had farm as well. And I remember at the time of harvest. When rice is to be harvested. At the time of harvest. When maize is to be harvested. And the maize, you know, it just looked like this. And you cannot see the end of the farm. And we are just a small, moderate family. My father and then, uh, you know, the other members of the family, we couldn't do all the harvest together. And I remember when my father came back from farm and he knew that the, farm, the harvest is about ripe. And in a few weeks that he's going to be harvesting. And he would look at all the field and, you know, whenever we had the yam farm, oh, it, it was mighty. You know, just on and on and on. That sometimes we'll be walking and walking and you are very careful. We were careful as little children because you know if you just watch you may not know the way back to the center where we were you know we cooked in the afternoon and ate in the afternoon you know what i mean and uh, because of the lightness of the farm but when my father came back from farm you know what he will do instead of just sitting down at home my father will go to his neighbors and he will say uh, how busy are you during this harvest time as your own yam, uh, you know, developed and matured, mine has matured, mine has developed, and this is the time to harvest the yam. He'll be getting them. He wasn't too educated. He wasn't a university fellow. He didn't have a degree, but he knew that the harvesters needed a call, a call for harvesters. And then he will get them on paper. He'll give them the date. He'll give them the time, and he will register them. He couldn't try it very much, but he knew that you promised me at this time, you'll be in the farm. When he got in there, then he will, he will get out and go to another person, and he will say, I need harvesters. 
in my, on my farm and I need this and this and then he will get them and then he will go all, to other places. He will call them and when we were going to start the harvesting of the field uh, that has rice or maize or yam or whatever, you'll see a lot of people. Some people that I never knew were friends to my daddy before. They will all come to our house because they will gather in our house first and each and after that they will now go to the farm and my father knew how to make people work he himself will be working he'll be leading them and i, I used to see him uh, that man even though he didn't have you this year they call it now administration they even take a degree in it now my father did not know theory he knew practical immediately we got in there he'll say this is your own role and by he'll give the time before we take lunch you are going to finish it to that point he'll get the other fellow he will you know say you are going to finish to that point get the other fellow he will distribute the work and then he will take his own where all the other people can see him that he is not sleeping he is not idle and he'll be working and if he saw anybody now it, my, i didn't know that they call it motivation at that time you know i was so young i don't even know that my daddy knew it was motivation but you know while he was uh, you know working and harvesting he'll be singing and whistling please turn the cassette over will call him by a good name a pet name and he will he will compare him with another pair and say ah, look at so and so so and so is going to finish before you get they got discouraged don't say don't don't join us. we will change other ministers of the gospel those who have been lazy will make them hard working those who have been indulgent will make them to be enduring and those who are giving up by the grace of god as you go out no minister if anybody was dragging behind he will call him by a good name a pet name and he will he will compare him with another pair and say ah, look at so and so so and so is going to finish before you and i didn't understand as a little child now i know we call that motivation now i know that all that he did he was doing some delegation and he was doing some distribution of the work and he was telling the people you do this and you do this and he did supervision he will leave his own and then go around and say ah uh, so and so he will call him and say you did it he will not say your work is not well done I didn't know that you called that communication that time but now I understand it's good communication he will not say ah so and so I didn't know this how you will work if I knew I will not bring you on my farm he will say so and so you overlooked something here come and see let me show you something and that fellow will run and say and then he will laugh he had a, he had a way of laughing even though he's dead now but i still remember very clearly and uh, he will that person and then he will slap him on the back and say you you do your work do that thing and then the fellow will go back to that place and clear it up again and at the end of the day you know after we come together again we fellowship together and every then he will remind them tomorrow at this time we're in the house again until we finished the harvest if my daddy could do that because he knew the urgency of the harvest why can't we do that why are we doing it alone why don't you allow yourself to be sent by the spirit of god and go to other people and reg and let them know the call of god upon their lives and go to other people that are idle other people maybe their church work they do not know how they will build up their church work and be very involved and be very dedicated and have a lot that they will do why don't you go to them why don't you tell them the lord is calling you the lord is calling you i believe when we leave this place we will change other ministers of the gospel those who have been lazy will make them hard working those who have been indulgent will make them to be enduring and those who are giving up by the grace of god as you go out no minister in your country will give up the ministry your no minister in your city in your community will give up the work that god has called them to do don't mind about their denomination don't mind about the name that they are having somebody has been preaching the gospel before and you hear information uh, so and so is not preaching again because you know he get he got discouraged don't say don't don't join the gossiping crowd don't join the people that be finding fault don't join the people that oh i knew you will never continue till the end that man he offended me three years ago bury that one and you say oh that's my fellow minister if the devil can do that to him he can do it to me 
and if I see my fellow minister falling, my fellow minister getting discouraged, we that are spiritual, we should help the people that are falling and restore them into the ministry again, taking care that you yourself will not be tempted. Let's help other ministers of the gospel and know that the call of God is urgent on everyone. The harvest truly really is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send laborers into the harvest field. Number two, concentration on the harvest. You see, there is a call. Number two, there is a concentration on the harvest. There are a lot of people, they do not concentrate on the work they are doing. You know what I learned as a student when I was growing up? I learned that if we're going to pass any exam, we must concentrate at the time of the exam. There is uh, something we call the preparation of the mind. The preparation of your disposition, your attitude, before you go for an exam, an important exam. And what I learned as a student is that as a child, even as a person that was growing up, that if you are going to pass your exam in the examination hall, never allow your mind to think about mommy, about daddy, about friends, about football, about the good food you ate yesterday, about some good, good things. Do not even allow yourself to think about the need of the body. You know, when I was a student and I, I studied mathematics, as some of you may know, and that thing requires concentration, real concentration. If you are a person that is easily diverted, a person that easily loses con con um, uh, concentration, a person that is easily distracted by say, a bird is flying there, a lizard is crawling there, a, a snake is going on there, something, a uh, merriment is going on there, you'll never be able to do it. And even when I was studying, because my father, with all the family art, he didn't have the money to send me beyond secondary school. I had to study myself to do my A-level in mathematics. And doing those things were very hard. And because I knew that there was no father to sponsor me, there was nobody that would send me uh, to HSC, if I didn't do it myself, I would never be educated. Therefore, I, will, I bought all the books I needed, and I concentrated on the work. And I burnt the midnight oil. And I will read far into the night. I had to concentrate on that job like that before I could make it. And thank God I was able to make it. And eventually, I went to the university. Because all my other classmates went to HSC. And I was maybe one of the two people or so that didn't go to HSC. I was at a disadvantage. When I did physics at the university, I'd never seen all the things they were talking about because I, when I was doing my own uh, work, I never saw any laboratory. And there was nowhere that I could go because I didn't go to a regular HSC school. Therefore, when I got to the university and they were teaching us physics and all the experiments and all the, some of the instruments, some of the things we were using at the laboratory, I'd never seen them before. And some of the graphs we were told to draw and some of the formulae, I, I'd never seen them before. And all the other people that had seen them before, <laughs> I said I must be very careful now so that I do not stand at a disadvantage. You know what I had to do? I needed to concentrate. Whenever the lecturer was lecturing, all the other people that went to HSC, they might be writing letters to girlfriends, they might be doing some other things, I could not. If I did, I would never have got any certificate. And if there is anything that the education I had had done for me, it is the ability to concentrate on a particular matter and keep on at it until I finish it. The ministers of the gospel will need that. You know, when my father called all these people at the harvesting time, and, and my father knew many jokes, my father knew many stories, my father knew a lot about people in our community. My father knew a lot of our, you know, native songs. My father knew a lot of proverbs. You know, when I was very young, I, I liked to sit very near him. That's when there was no harvest. When things were relaxed, my father knew how to get all these people around and just tell them some jokes and tell them some light stories and, tell, and give them some proverbs. And when people were fighting in town, you know, in our community, and they couldn't settle the quarrel, there was one place they came to that was my father. Because he had the appropriate proverb that will settle you and make you feel why were we fighting. But 
at the time of the harvest, my father never joked. Never, never. He never told any story. He never did anything. And if anybody wanted to bring up any matter that will divert his attention from the harvest, he, had, he knew what to say to bring them back to that harvest. You know what we discover today? There are ministers of the gospel, they do not concentrate, concentrate on the harvest. They are easily diverted. If they have a program to evangelize, they have a program to make the church grow, they have a program to strengthen the ministry that God has given them, they are jumping and hopping here and there. They are busy about nothing. They are easily diverted into things that are less important. But at this time of the harvest, we need concentration on the harvest. If I could, uh, there's no time for me to read to you all the harvesting time in the Bible. But let me just remind you, at the time of Ruth and Boaz. You see, Boaz got all these people together and they were harvesting. And then Ruth came. Ruth was a stranger in the land. And uh, Naomi had, uh, come, had brought her into the children of Israel, into the country. And uh, they had nothing to eat. And if they didn't go and harvest and get something done, they will not be able to have anything. And then Ruth followed after the reapers on the field. You know the thing that he said about Ruth? When Boaz was going to talk to her, he said, I've heard about you. And I've been watching you. Yet that you do not follow any of the men in the city. That you just do what you are supposed to do. You see, you, you should concentrate at the time of the harvest. This is no time to waste. This is no time to be running up and down. This is no time to be busy about things that are less important. We must concentrate on the harvest. But as we concentrate on the harvest... You should select your tools. You see, the tools we use in planting is different from the tool we use in harvesting. You see, the tools we use in conserving the fruit is different from the tools we use in harvesting. That's why we feel committed in deeper life to organize conferences like this, where we can bring ministers of the gospel together and we can share tools with them, tools with them, and um, many times, I, I do not generally want to talk about myself, except when I find it is very, very necessary to be able to help the people that are listening to me. Uh, the, the things that uh, Vincent has been talking about, uh, because he saw that I wasn't, uh, you know, I didn't want him to talk too much about those things. Uh, that's why, because he saw my reaction, that's why he couldn't, uh, you know, continue and continue and all that. But overseas, uh, people know that Deeper Life specializes in strategy. And that in, when we say strategy, how to harvest, how to evangelize, how to map things out, because uh, we study it. And uh, I probably know a lot of uh, organizations and a lot of strategies going on in the world and what other people are doing and what we can do and what the believers and the ministers in Nigeria should be doing to evangelize this country. Because uh, I give my time to study. I really study all those things. And uh, 1988, 1987, some people knew about me and uh, the the ministers uh, overseas. And they knew that the Lord had blessed uh, this ministry with uh, some insight into evangelization, some insight into church growth, some insight into signs and wonders. And um, 1988, April, they brought all these people together, about 5,000 of them. And it's uh, an old uh, denomination. The denomination have been there for about more than 70 years. They started in 1916. And you see, 1916 to 1987 uh, was uh, more than 70 years. And uh, they called me and they said, Well, with your experience and all the things you have known, come and share with us. And they gave me a free hand, and it was a Bible study session. You know, in the morning hours like this, I'll just, you know, come on, and then I will get them through the whole series on signs and wonders. Now, some people don't know that you can teach signs and wonders. You can teach people into how to move in signs and wonders, how to heal the sick, how to see the miraculous, how to see the spectacular. 
and uh, by the grace of God, our own state overseers have uh, done a little work with them, and um, we can talk about a lot of miracles they have seen. With some of our people here in Lagos, uh, like some of the testimonies I shared with you last night, some of them already know, you know, some of these things, and I went to Britain, and I shared with them signs and wonders five mornings and they were real solid teaching from the bible from church history from contemporary events and from testimonies of what i've seen the methodology the approach and the attitude the way to prepare your mind the way to prepare for a ministry like that and things like that and i, I got them through and you know and we had a, what we'll call practical sessions after giving them the teaching and the theory and all the examples and the testimonies we demonstrated while you know while closing the meeting then i will you know pray for people uh, sometimes by the word of knowledge for them because after teaching them the word of knowledge i needed to demonstrate to them uh, not uh, because I, you know, feel that I can pull the spirit or move the spirit myself, but the Lord gives me the liberty and he gives me the anointing and it was demonstrated to them. And the evening session, uh, it was the Lord really blessed the people and they started telling one another that this is happening. And uh, from the reports I've heard, there are some of those churches that moved in the supernatural. I went to, I think it's Portmore, Portsmouth in, um, in Britain. And they, they accommodated myself and my wife with one brother, the assistant pastor. And we were there just for about, um, about five days. And he asked me a lot of questions. You know, I would teach in the church. And he's the assistant pastor. And I had never moved in the gifts of the spirit before. Never. And, uh, but in the house, he will sit me down. He will ask me questions. I will explain to him. I will use I will open Bible to him. And uh, the last night... He, and when I talk to him, he will go up to his room in his house and he will pray and pray and pray. Then at the last night, just, uh, you know, spending five days with him or having the meeting. And before I came on to preach that night, he began to pray. Uh, that's public uh, prayer in the meeting. And it was wonderful what the Lord started with him that night. I think the Lord just wanted to assure me that what I've done there was not a waste while the people were praying he said that there's somebody there and it was right on the dot when the person did not trace up his hand he gave some descriptions and said this is when you came in and this is what happened to you and this is the problem you had and the fellow raised up his hand and the whole church they were wild with excitement because you know they know him as the assistant pastor and he had never moved in the supernatural like that before you know we can help one another in this harvesting we're talking about and we can help one another so that by the grace of god how to have the tools and select the tools we will have it in jesus name it's just a matter of time and i pray that god will help you to be open god will make you to be receptive so that everything the Lord has for every one of us will be able to do it in Jesus' name. I talked about the selection of tools. That's why I came to the gifts of the Spirit. And then the selection of the people. You concentrate on the habits. To the point that you are looking for people that will assist you. People that will walk along with you. People that will help you in the work there is to be done. Harvesting demands that will gather people together. You know, I told you that my father always went to those people. He selected them. And then, at the time of the harvest, we all concentrated on the harvest. You know, even at that time, uh, if I was on holidays, everybody went to the farm. And my mother will have to go to the farm. All the servants, all the people that were serving in our home, that were living with us, who were not children of my father, everybody had to be on the farm. And all the people that my father had spoken to, everybody had to go to the farm. But look at something. My father will first bring them to the house in the morning as the meeting point, And he will give them good food. And they will be well fed. And while, you know, they are eating, he'll make sure that everybody eats. Well, I didn't, uh, all that time, 
I, I don't know how my father got all those things. Sometimes while they're eating, he will, you know, say some things to make everybody happy. And he'll say, uh, so and so, he'll call those who are serving. Uh, give him more. He has finished his food. That one is not enough. Oh, I'm all right. Oh, no, you are not all right. Because you are going to work hard today. He's preparing their mind. Preparing their mind for the work there is to be done. But you know something? That is fellowship. And ministers of the gospel, we need fellowship together. The only problem I have with some people that talk about fellowship is that they only eat and laugh and joke and they never go for evangelism. And my father would not have brought any of those men to our house if all they did is that after eating, they would say, oh, my father, it's wonderful. We'll come tomorrow again. And they never followed my father to the farm. My father will never allow you to come the second day. Because it was harvesting time. He gave you that food so that immediately you finish eating, where do you go? You go to the farm. And you know, people who are gathering together today as ministers of the gospel, just fellowship. Just fellowship. Just fellowship. We get in there, we don't discuss how to evangelize the sage. We get in there, we don't plan how to evangelize the whole city. We get in there, we do not plan how the ministers will develop and grow and have a greater power in doing the work of the Lord. We just come together for fellowship and we just sing and we just praise the Lord. And then after spending about one hour or two hours together and say, oh, brother, so and so you came, sister, so and so you came. We drink minerals, we drink a lot of things we want to drink. Then we say, praise the Lord, hallelujah, bye-bye now. We'll meet next month again for our fellowship of ministers. I never joined that kind of thing. I want a kind of fellowship that after that fellowship, we go to the field. We go to the farm. And this is the kind of thing we have this week. You know, this week, we eat together. And we relate together. We fellowship together. We sing together. But the singing, the eating, the fellowship is not the climax. The climax is when you are challenged. That after the fellowship and the gathering together, we go to the farm. And let me leave this with you. That this is harvesting time. As ministers are congregating together, let the congregation of ministers, let the fellowship of ministers, let all these things lead into my third point, cooperation for harvesting. Number one is the call for harvesters. Number two, concentration on the harvest. And number three, cooperation for harvesting. We need to cooperate together. And I'm sure you heard a lot about that yesterday, about team spirit, about working together. Uh, you see, if we're going to work together, we will have to sink our differences. That means forget our differences. There is a lot of uh, jealousy, a lot of envy, a lot of backbiting, a lot of competition that do not allow people to cooperate together for harvesting. But you know, if you look at the members of the body, members of your own body, it is in cooperation that you will be able to have the work to be done. Let me give you this illustration and let me put it in the form of a story, in the form of a parable. You know, Jesus used parables. Do you know that? And Jesus used children in parables. He used birds in parable. He used men and women in parable. He used the kitchen and the cooking in parable. He used the fishermen and their fishing in parable. He used their nets in parable. He used almost virtually everything in parable. He used the marketplace and the street in parable. Let's have, some, let's have a parable. Concerning this cooperation we are talking about, uh, imagine all these five fingers arguing, saying, the thumb, I'm the most important. Why? Because you cannot hold anything together without my cooperation. Have you ever tried to hold your biro, hold a cutlass, hold a book without using your tongue? You use all the other hands, all the other fingers. Have you ever tried to dress up and you cannot use your tongue? Well, that means then that you are incapacitated because the term, very significant, very significant. But then you cannot hold anything without the term. So the argument is, I'm the most important. That's what the term said. Because before you can hold anything, keep anything together, you have to use me. Then this finger, pointing finger, said, you are making a mistake. I am the fellow 
that points out every criminal. You try to point to somebody. You, Tom, try to point. You can't do it. I'm the fellow that points at the people. I'm the one they recognize and they fear me because when I point to them, they know that I'm, I'm, I'm ready to say something about them. The other fellow said, I will not say anything. You, Tom, you are arguing. You are the most important. And you, pointing finger, you are arguing. You are the most important. Before I talk, let everybody stand up. Don't stand up. That's what the next finger said. He said, before I talk, let everybody stand up. And then they all stood up. He said, look around. Who is the highest, the greatest, the tallest, the most important? He said, no argument. I'm the one that is so important. So the other fellow, after all, the other three have argued out there. Do you know the most important? The other fellow said, you poor people. Whoever puts a ring of gold upon you. I am the most important. I am the richest one. Anybody that wants to have engagement, they put the engagement ring on me. Don't you know that? Anybody that gets married and wants to use a golden ring, they put it on me. All you poor people go and sit down. I'm the richest. I'm the most important. And then, uh, you know, the, the little finger was waiting for them and uh, all these people had their points and the most important and the greatest and the other fellow said, you know, you cannot make any point without me. When you do your hand like this and you beat the uh, chair or you beat the table like this, who gets the weight of all of you? Is carrying the weight of everybody. I'm the one that carries the weight of everybody. And I'm so strong and so important. I wonder why you didn't know that you were arguing about the greatest. I just kept quiet to be the last person that will talk. Anytime you want to make a point, you do that. I carry the weight of the whole of you. And then somebody, a wise man, came in and said, What are you all arguing about? And well, and they you know, brought all this argument. And the other fellow said, He put a ball down. And he said, Thumb, take it. And the thumb couldn't take it. He tried to take it. The thing was rolling. Uh, you pointing finger, take it. He tried to, you know, take it. The, thi the thing was rolling. And you highest and tallest and greatest finger, none. And then, uh, you know, the richest finger, the one that has all the golden ring, he could not. And the little finger could not. And the wise man told them, if you are individuals, you'll never do it. Come together. Come together. Come together. It's when you come together. Then he told them to come together and pick up the ball. They picked up the ball. It's so easy when you are cooperating together. Don't argue about who is greatest, who is wisest, who is richest, who is strongest. Let us come together. Come together. It is as we cooperate and come together, we'll be able to harvest this country for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I see there's a lot of cooperation here. We met uh, last night group by group and it's wonderful I asked uh, you know this morning how did it come out uh, did they argue was there fighting and contention and how beautiful when they told me oh there was a beautiful spirit in our camp and that people just forgot about our who we are who we are not and, and that we're just ready to work together am I right and we're ready to harvest this whole country together a new day is beginning a new era is beginning. A day of cooperation. A day of working together. In unity, in fellowship, in love, in harmony. And I believe in cooperation we shall be able to do it in Jesus' name. Number four, conservation of the harvest. Conservation of the harvest. You know, no matter how hard working we are, and no matter what we are able to do, without conserving the fruit, and that brings us to church growth again. Without conserving the fruit, saying we have harvested from the field, we have brought the thing from the field, but now we need to conserve, we need to preserve, we need to keep the people integrated into the body of Christ. Without it, we'll not be able to really show anything for our work. The call, the concentration, the cooperation and the conservation of the harvest. Let's look at this in Jeremiah chapter 5. 
Jeremiah chapter 5. And in verse 24. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 24. Neither say they in their heart, Let us now fear the Lord our God, that giveth rain both the former and the latter. In his season he reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Brothers and sisters, the time we have before us is the appointed time of the Lord reserved for harvesting. If there is anything that is important for us as ministers of the gospel today, it is harvesting of the field. And let us know that the time we have, let us know the years we have between now, if they are years or months or weeks or days, between now and the coming of the Lord has been reserved unto the harvest. We are supposed to be harvesters. And this time, we shouldn't be wasting any time, wasting any effort, wasting any resources. We should con con concentrate and consecrate ourselves to the Lord that these appointed weeks, appointed moments for harvesting, we're going to do it in Jesus' name. And I pray that as we leave this conference, the strength of the Lord, the power of the Lord, the provision of the Lord. All the resources from above will be available to you in Jesus' name. Whatever you need, the Lord will supply. And anywhere you, anywhere you are, remember, you have people in Lagos there praying along with you. And you have people in uh, every state praying along with you. You have any need and you want to develop on your strategy, on your plans, you are wondering how you can take, uh, you know, some areas of your community for the Lord. If you need any help, you have people that will be able to lend you, you know, some wisdom, some idea, and some methodology. And will say, well, this is how we did it before. You can try this. And you have people that can even come to you and say, well, work together with you. And then after, you know, what my father did those days, a beautiful, beautiful method. After they all came to work in my father's farm, you know what we did? We also went to the other person's farm and we worked there. You know, after we finished our own harvest, because everybody just working in my father's farm, we finished it in, in time. And then in that harvesting season, it's by rotation. Then we go to another person's farm and, uh, and at that time too, we will eat in his house. And since they ate in our house, and the soup they ate, and the yam, and, and we, we knew how to prepare pounded yam in the part of the country I come from. And my father knew that since that was our specialty, he will give them the specialty. And then when we go to their own, if, you know, they come from the area where uh, the one they know how to prepare is gari. You know, they prepare the gari. Sometimes when we get to the house, I'll ask my daddy. I say, Daddy, uh, the gari eba is so hard that if you throw it at somebody, the person will fall down. And my daddy will say, shut up. When you are in cooperation, you never find fault. And you know, I learned that today too, that as children of God, as ministers of the gospel, when we are cooperating together, we never find fault. Whatever they give you each, whatever is, just rejoice in the Lord and say we are grateful that we can work together. Before we pray, we'll sing again, Jesus sent more laborers. Can you rise up? For the Lord will see the need. The Lord is ready for harvest. The fields are ripe indeed. Jesus sent more laborers. For the Lord will see the need. The land is ready for harvest. The fields are ripe indeed. O oh Lord, but start with me. Jesus begin with me. O oh, will go for you.
Send me, send me, Lord, send me. Lord, we love our country, countless lives to be won. Jesus, bring revival that through us your will be done. Oh Lord, God, start with me. Jesus, begin with me. I will go for you, Lord. I will go for you, Lord. Here I am, Lord. Send me, send me, Lord. Send me. Lord, we sense your moving, touching our lives with power. We are ready to serve you to go this day this hour Send me, send me, Lord, send me. Put the books in your hand down. Oh, Lord, but start with me. Jesus, begin with me. Oh, I'll go for you. Send me, send me, Lord, send. Do you mean it? Oh, Lord, but start. Send me, send me, Lord, send me. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Tell him to send you. 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 To send you. That you are willing. You are willing to do the work of the Lord going to the harvest fields many people are perishing harvest them bring them into the kingdom of God in Jesus name we pray in Jesus name we pray our father we want to bless your name because you are a great God you are a merciful God and we bless you very much for what you have done for us and in us this period of the conference. We glorify you because harvest is ripe and we are ready to serve you. Father, we are praying that as you are starting with us today to evangelize Nigeria and beyond Nigeria, we pray you will never leave us in Jesus' name. Amen. We have been praying for the harvesters. And here we are presenting our lives unto you 
consecrated to the service of the Lord. Father, we are praying that nobody will withdraw his consecration to you and to the work of the Lord in Jesus' name. We are believing you that by the grace of God, this Nigeria shall know that Jesus Christ is Lord. We are believing from the north to the east, all the places in Gongola, near Cameroon, everywhere, where we have been told today, the grace and the power to read the people, we pray you give to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Many, many ministers of the word of God, we only concentrate in the capitals of the state of Nigeria. We never go to the north. We never go to the remotest part of the country. Father, we are praying that your hand will be laid upon us to move to any corner of the country and to reach the people in Jesus' name. Amen. The work is great. Many, many people, they have no Bibles in their languages. And we believe you can use us. You can touch us to be able to translate Bible to other languages. Father, we pray you will do it in our time in Jesus' name. Amen. Every method we need, all the strategies we need to be able to get the literates and the women and the children to the side of the Lord. Father, we pray you give to us in Jesus' name. Amen. The Muslims are there. Who, are not, who, are, who, don't, who, don't, who don't know about Jesus Christ and they are just worshipping other gods. Father, we are praying that your grace will be upon us to know how to reach them in Jesus' name. Amen. All over the states of Nigeria, we pray revival will come down in Jesus' name. Amen. As we are going, Father, we pray that your grace will go with us. Amen. I'm so excited today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. So I just thank God. Third year, the same thing. And I thank God because I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have to take out the loan. I just thank God for all this. I just missed you. Great.